Hello, welcome back to the History Sphere. What you're about to hear is part 9 of a long and winding series on the decline and fall of the Soviet Union. If you're the kind of person that likes to have the full context of a story, you may want to go back and listen to those earlier episodes. If you don't need context and you're happy joining us in the middle of the story, then by all means stick around. I'm not usually the sort of person to give warnings about content before I discuss it. I generally assume that if you're listening to an educational history podcast, you're mature enough to know that history is not always pleasant, and we might touch on some uncomfortable subjects. Today's a little different. I'm going to be talking in a pretty detailed way about the Holocaust and other crimes and atrocities committed during the Second World War. The subject matter is terribly important, and I hope you'll stick around and listen, even if it makes you uncomfortable, but listener discretion is advised. Now that that's out of the way, without further ado, this is The End of History, Part 9. When I was a senior in college, I visited Russia for the first time. I was enrolled in a language immersion program at Moscow University for the Humanities, or Moscow for short. One night I was hanging out with the Russian friends I'd made in the neighborhood where I was staying. The conversation meandered between topics both serious and comical, as conversations between friends often do. Eventually the topic of patriotism came up. When one of them asked me if I loved my country, I explained in the broken Russian that I was still far from mastering that I did love my country and I was proud of my country, but that I often did not love my government. It was a sentiment they all seemed to agree with. One spoke up and talked specifically about the Second World War and the victory of the Red Army, expressing his national pride in that achievement, but went on to complain that the government of modern Russia was corrupt. One of them, to my shock, blurted out, Jews! Our government is run by Jews! I was shocked. I I didn't respond right away, and... Thinking I must not have understood his Russian, he repeated the word in English, Jews. I looked around at my other friends, expecting them to be as shocked as me, but instead I saw several of them nodding in agreement. If this had been the first time I met these guys, I I might not have said anything, and the night may have ended there, but I'd known these guys for a couple of months at this point, during which we'd been hanging out almost every day. So I explained my own background. I said that my own family that had come to America from Russia were Jews. He then explained that he had nothing against Jewish people and that he had used the term to describe greedy people in general and did not literally mean that they were Jewish. I accepted his explanation and I wrote the comment off as a politically incorrect slip-up. I moved on. I didn't yet have the language skills to have a deeper conversation about it anyway, but if I'm being honest, it troubled me, and years later it still troubles me. It was a moment that showcased the anti-Semitism that is deeply rooted in Russian society. I don't tell this story to show that Russians are evil or hateful. I don't believe that at all. I've never felt more welcome in any country outside of my own, and my experience in Russia was mostly positive. But just like the legacy of slavery and racism is an inescapable truth in the history of my own country, the United States, deep, Often, violent anti-Semitism is an inescapable truth of Russian history. And while Russians, like Americans, have made great strides in moving beyond this negative aspect of their history, its effects are still felt today. Jews living in the Russian Empire of the Tsars, especially during the reign of the last two Tsars, Alexander III and Nicholas II, were probably worse off than Jewish communities anywhere else in the world. The government of the Tsars very intentionally stoked anti-Semitic hatred as a tool for promoting unity with non-Russian Christian peoples, especially and particularly as a tactic to combat budding Ukrainian, Belarusian, and Polish nationalism, a policy that culminated in the pogroms of the early 1900s that resulted in thousands of deaths among the empire's Jewish population. The Bolsheviks rejected anti-Semitism, which, as I covered in an earlier episode, gained them disproportionate support among Russia's Jewish population. Lenin once said in a conversation with Trotsky that anti-Semitism was, quote, the worst kind of ignorance, end quote. 
The communists elevated Jews to the status of one of the USSR's official nationalities, and they encouraged the embrace of Jewishness as an ethnic and cultural identity. But the atheistic communists did not spare Judaism from their persecution against religion. It was officially suppressed along with Christianity, Islam, and religion generally. Restrictions on higher education and professional advancement, as well as restrictions on where they could live that had been enforced by the Tsarist regime, were no more, and Jews in the early decades of the Soviet Union flourished, with many of them embracing the new system and joining the Communist Party. Even after Stalin, who harbored anti-Semitic views personally, came to power, he did not at first embrace any official persecution of Jews, though he would later on, especially after the war, pursue a campaign of official anti-Semitism, and I will cover that in a later episode. Stalin's daughter Svetlana, one of the only people Stalin seems to have truly loved, even married a Jewish man in 1944. Stalin disapproved of and discouraged the match, but he didn't kill the young man. And that may not seem like a lot, but killing people was generally Stalin's preferred solution to any problem. That he chose not to solve this particular problem in that way suggests a reluctant acceptance of his new son-in-law. Yet, the communists, for all their revolutionary vigor, could not undo centuries of anti-Semitism overnight, and anti-Semitic beliefs and attitudes remained common among many non-Jewish Soviet citizens, including many of the rank-and-file soldiers of the Red Army. The army during the war was forced to adopt regulations to limit and punish anti-Semitism, as many Jewish soldiers faced harassment from their non-Jewish comrades. Soviet propaganda throughout the war actually downplayed the Nazi persecution of Jews. This was not because they were unaware of it or in some way tacitly endorsed it, Rather, the Soviet propagandists made a conscious choice that for the sake of unity and morale, it was important to portray the Soviet Union generally, not just its Jewish citizens, as the primary victim of Nazi brutality. There was some truth to this perspective. By raw numbers, the Slavic citizens of the Soviet Union were by far the largest victims of the Nazis, their death toll numbering in the tens of millions. And for the most part, if you were to look at issues of the Communist Party newspaper, Pravda, or the army newspaper, Krasnaya Zvezda, meaning Red Star, from 1941 to 1943, you would find almost no mention at all of the Nazi persecution of Jews. Then, in 1944, the Red Army would sweep into Poland and begin to uncover evidence of the Nazis' final solution that was so gruesome, even Soviet propagandists could not ignore it and the soldiers who witnessed it would never forget it. The nature of the information they had been fed in Soviet propaganda meant that the Red Army soldiers who discovered the extermination camps in Poland were caught completely by surprise at what they discovered. Even if they had known, it likely wouldn't have made a difference when American and British soldiers first liberated concentration camps in the West a few months after the Soviets stumbled on the extermination camps. They were equally shocked despite the fact that their commanders had knowledge of what the Soviets found in Poland. The first of the extermination camps to be liberated was Majdanek, near Lublin, in Poland, in July 1944. As the Red Army troops advanced into the area, they had no information about any strategic targets in the area, but when they saw the high, electrified barbed wire fences and tall smokestacks of Majdanek, they believed it to be some kind of military base or factory, and they moved in to secure it. They found the camp, unlike other death camps that were liberated later, mostly intact. The speed of the Soviet advance in their summer 1944 offensive had given the Germans little time to destroy the evidence, as they would attempt to do at Auschwitz and other extermination camps in the path of their retreat. They found piles of emaciated bodies, piled like cordwood, next to crematoria that were, according to one soldier who witnessed it, still warm. The Nazis had continued their extermination right up until the last moment. The camp's SS guards had frantically shot as many of the prisoners as they could before making a hurried retreat to the west as the Soviets approached. But they were unable to kill everybody before they had to leave, and the Red Army found many survivors when they entered the camp. They also found gas chambers fully stocked with Zyklon B, the gas used to execute the prisoners, and warehouses full of shoes, clothes, spectacles, and other personal belongings of those who had been put to death in the camp. 
Soviet war correspondent Konstantin Simonov was flown to the camp, and in his account of what he witnessed, he stated, quote, At some period in the future, after thorough and painstaking inquiry, the full immensity of the crime against humanity committed here by the Germans will come to light, end quote. He went on to say that, quote, an immense number of Jews were brought to the camp to be exterminated from literally every country in Europe, from Poland to Holland, end quote. An American journalist from the New York Times who visited the camp shortly after Simonov, Bill Lawrence, was more blunt, stating, quote, I have just seen the most terrible place on the face of the earth, end quote. Then, in January 1945, the Red Army liberated the network of concentration and extermination camps known as Auschwitz, the largest in the Nazis' genocidal machine. The SS had more warning of the Soviet advance this time, and they tried to destroy the evidence of their crimes before abandoning the camp. They demolished the gas chambers and most of the crematoria, and forced all the prisoners who were healthy enough to move on a forced death march west to camps in Germany and Austria. But they could not destroy all the evidence, and several thousand prisoners had either successfully hidden from them or were too weak to move. Without sufficient time or ammunition to execute them all, the Nazis were forced to leave them behind. 31-year-old Soviet General Vasily Petrenko commanded one of the Red Army divisions that liberated the camp. He would describe his shock, stating, quote, I had seen a lot of terrible scenes while fighting on the front lines. I saw my comrades dying. I saw signs of German atrocities in the territories we freed. Dozens of people hanged by the Germans. Women and children shot to death. What I saw in the camp was beyond any comparison. I saw 82 children from 3 to 14 years old, racked by criminal medical experiments. I saw women and children who resembled skeletons, who couldn't even smile in a human manner. They had tears in their eyes, but they couldn't even sob. I saw bags filled with women's hair. They told me there were seven tons of hair there. How many women did they have to kill to get such an amount of hair? When our troops moved in, the Nazis saw they did not have time to gas the remaining prisoners, so they started shooting them, spraying the barracks with machine gun fire. When I came there, I saw thousands of dead bodies. The barracks were flooded with blood. End quote. Another Red Army officer, Georgi Elisavitsky, who was Jewish, recalled in 1980 that his blood still ran cold when he thought of Auschwitz. He recounted his story, stating, quote, When I entered the barrack, I saw living skeletons lying on the three-tiered bunks. As in fog, I hear my soldiers saying, You are free, comrades. I sense that they do not understand and begin speaking to them in Russian, Polish, German, Ukrainian dialects. Unbuttoning my leather jacket, I show them my medals. Then I use Yiddish. Their reaction is unpredictable. They think that I am provoking them. They begin to hide, and only when I said to them, Do not be afraid. I'm a colonel in the Soviet army and a Jew. We have come to liberate you. Finally, as if a barrier collapsed, they rushed towards us, shouting, fell on their knees, kissed the flaps of our overcoats, and threw their arms around our legs. We could not move, stood motionless, while unexpected tears ran down our cheeks. End quote. A 26-year-old enlisted man, Pyotr Nikitin, wrote home to his parents immediately after he and his comrades witnessed the horrors of Auschwitz. He could not reveal the details to them as the military mail was censored, but the sentiment produced by the experience was clear. He told them, quote, My dear ones, I have no words to relate to you what we have seen on our difficult soldier's path. How to settle accounts with these bloody, damned fascist degenerates for all their evil deeds. There is no punishment horrible enough, and no one could ever come up with an appropriate retribution. Please know, my dear parents, that we will take revenge on the enemy for everything. We will forget nothing, and we will never forgive. End quote. Revenge and retribution are perhaps the best terms to describe what happened when the Red Army made it to Germany. Their journey to Berlin had begun in July 1943 at the Battle of Kursk, where the Soviets turned back the last major German offensive of the war on the Eastern Front. Kursk is remembered today by military historians as the largest tank battle in history. The German commanders gambled their last major reserves of tanks and artillery on a desperate attempt to push through a salient in the Soviet lines around Kursk 
and drive towards Moscow. They lost this gamble, and most of that equipment was destroyed, along with thousands of lives. There would be lots of hard fighting ahead of the Soviets after Kursk on the road to Berlin, but they had destroyed the German capacity to make offensive warfare. The initiative had permanently shifted to the Red Army, and the outcome was no longer in serious doubt. Also in 1943, the British and Americans had driven the Germans out of North Africa, captured Sicily, landed in southern Italy, and knocked Italy out of the war. Following up on their victory at Kursk, the Soviets launched a massive offensive in the south, advancing rapidly and recovering most of eastern Ukraine, with Kiev being liberated in December. By 1943, the Red Army was a very different force from the defeated masses of 1941. It was not only the largest in the world, but its quality was also among the best. These soldiers were battle-hardened, they were well-equipped, well-trained, well-fed, and well-led. As the war went on, though Stalin would never admit to any mistakes, he did seem to learn from them. More and more, he was stepping back from trying to micromanage tactical decisions, a behavior that had led to many of the disasters the Red Army suffered early in the war. When it came to military matters, he deferred to the professionals, commanders who had proven their worth like Georgi Zhukov and Ivan Konyev, and he stuck to what he was good at, politics. As the walls closed in around him, Hitler was increasingly moving in the opposite direction. The following June, the British and Americans finally crossed the English Channel, landing in Normandy and opening the long-awaited Second Front in Europe. The Soviets also launched massive offensives across the entire Eastern Front to coincide with the Normandy landings and keep the pressure up on the Germans on all sides. By July 1944, the Allies were advancing on all fronts. In the east, the Red Army liberated Minsk and pressed on to cross the pre-1941 frontier into German-occupied Poland. Further south, they advanced across western Ukraine and crossed the frontier into Romania. In August, the King of Romania, a constitutional monarch widely considered as a figurehead, joined forces with opposition politicians and overthrew the pro-German fascist government. The Germans attempted to reverse the coup by force, and Romania promptly switched sides and threw their one million strong army into the struggle on the side of the Allies. With the turning of Romania, Germany did not just lose a key ally, but also access to the Romanian oil fields, which was their only remaining supply of crude oil. To the north, in September, Finland capitulated, and also turned their army against their erstwhile German allies to expel them from the country. On the Western Front, the British and Americans had broken out of Normandy, and swept across France in July and August, reaching the Rhine River in September, the last major defensive barrier preventing the Allies from entering the heart of Germany. Everywhere, the walls were closing in on the Third Reich. By this point, anyone who was not completely brainwashed by Nazi propaganda could see that Germany would lose the war, and that disaster loomed. So in July, a group of German army officers and civil servants led by Colonel Count Klaus von Stauffenberg executed a plot to assassinate Hitler, overthrow the Nazis, and seek an end to the war that averted the complete destruction of Germany. Hitler survived. The plot failed, the plotters were executed, and Hitler emerged from the ordeal convinced that he had been saved by divine providence. He was more convinced than ever that with God's help, his Third Reich would achieve final victory. There was nobody left alive who could challenge Hitler's power. The war could not end now without Germany's utter destruction. Then, in August, Urged on by the Soviet advance and hoping to replicate the actions of the French resistance by capturing their own capital before the arrival of the Soviets, the Polish underground army rose in Warsaw. Their goal was to seize control of the capital and fly in the London-based government in exile to establish itself before the Soviets could establish a rival communist government in Poland. The sources differ on what happened next, some sources indicate the Soviet offensive was stopped and ran out of steam short of Warsaw, while others state that Stalin intentionally halted his forces short of Warsaw for political reasons. Stalin's post-war strategy, which was at this point beginning to develop, was to set up friendly communist regimes in Eastern European countries like Poland 
in order to create a friendly buffer zone between his country and any potentially unfriendly Western countries that may pose a threat to his country in the future. He believed this was the best way to prevent the kind of invasion his people had just suffered from ever happening again. He did, in fact, have a rival government of friendly Polish communists ready to go once Warsaw was taken. Whether it was intentional or not, it suited Stalin's purposes for his forces to halt outside of Warsaw that summer. The Red Army stood by and did nothing as the Polish resistance was crushed by the Germans. Not only did Stalin refuse to aid the uprising, but he refused to allow British or American airplanes seeking to aid the uprising to refuel in Soviet-held territory. A dead giveaway as to his intentions. That fall, Hitler lowered the age of conscription in Germany to 16 and began scraping the bottom of the barrel to replenish his dwindling armies in support of one last great gamble. The dice were thrown, however, not in the east against the rising Soviet tide, but in the west against the Americans. His plan was to launch an offensive that would force the British and Americans to sue for peace and allow him to focus his entire energy against the Soviets. Needless to say, at this late date in the war, such thinking was beyond fanciful. Though the attack in what came to be known as the Battle of the Bulge achieved surprise and gained some initial success, once the Americans regrouped, they stopped the German advance and destroyed the Germans' last remaining manpower reserves. The Allies were now clear to press on into Germany from all sides. In January 1945, the Red Army pressed on into Germany proper, beginning their final drive toward Berlin. In their path, they left a wake of destruction. For years in the face of Nazi brutality in the Soviet Union and elsewhere, Soviet propaganda had pressed the idea of revenge on their soldiers. And now, that revenge was at hand. As they advanced, the Red Army killed, looted, and raped. Above all, it was the rape of German women by Soviet soldiers that was unprecedented in its scale. It's impossible to know what proportion of Soviet soldiers engaged in this act of mass sexual violence. We have to keep in mind the size of the invading Red Army. There were literally millions of them. I'm inclined to believe that it was a minority of soldiers that actively raped German women on the advance, but there's no denying that it happened on a mass scale. Violence against German civilians was officially condemned by the Red Army Command, but unofficially, it was tolerated. There are precious few examples of any Soviet soldiers being punished for crimes against German civilians. Indeed, we find almost no mention at all of the brutality of Soviet soldiers in Germany in Soviet records. It was a conspiracy of silence. To this day, it's an aspect of the history of the war that most Russians are completely unaware of. It's illegal in Russia to impugn the honor of the Red Army veterans of the Great Patriotic War, and it's simply not taught to Russians. I've had the experience with some of my Russian friends where I tried to talk about it, and not only had they never heard of it, but they simply didn't believe me. But the evidence for this mass wave of sexual violence is overwhelming. Some estimates I read indicate that as many as 2 million German women may have been raped by Allied soldiers in 1945. It is noteworthy that this statistic includes rapes committed by British, American, and French forces. However, the problem was much more widespread on the Soviet side. Even Western histories, however, often express little sympathy for the German victims of Soviet brutality. After all, in scope and intensity, it paled in comparison to the crimes Germany committed all over Europe. Some accounts written closer to the events of World War II even frame it as a kind of justice being visited on the people of Germany for starting the war and for the horrifying way in which they conducted it. 79 years on, hopefully most of us now see things more clearly. This mass wave of rape, murder, and robbery cannot be excused or defended. But it can be understood in the context of 28 to 30 million Soviets dead at the hands of the Germans, the overwhelming majority of them civilians. The desire for collective revenge against the people of the nation that committed that crime is a natural human response. It's a sobering reminder of the irredeemable ugliness of modern war. The end was now approaching rapidly. 
In the west, the Allies crossed the Rhine in March and drove deep into the heart of Germany. In the east, the Soviets were closing in on Berlin, where Hitler and his closest lieutenants were holed up in the Fuhrer bunker, losing their minds. On April 20th, Hitler's 56th birthday, Berlin came within range of Soviet artillery. The constant bombardment would go on for the rest of the battle. Hitler retreated to his bunker and descended further into madness. He railed against the Jews and against his own people for failing to realize his grand vision for a thousand-year Reich. He moved non-existent divisions around on a map, ordering delusional counteroffensives and vacillating between cynical hopelessness and delusional discussions of his plans for the Reich after final victory was won. On April 25th, the Red Army completed its encirclement of the city and began its final push into the city center. Hitler had called up both the Volkssturm, a militia made up of old men, and the Hitler Youth, a sort of Nazi Boy Scouts made up of boys as young as 12, to serve in active combat to defend the city. Despite the hopelessness of their cause, the Germans put up stiff resistance, and the Soviets suffered over 100,000 casualties in the Battle of Berlin, but they could not be stopped. By April 29th, Soviet troops were only a few hundred yards from Hitler's bunker. Hitler dictated his last will and testament, and married his longtime mistress, Eva Braun. The next day, he named Admiral Karl Donitz, chief of the German Navy, as his successor. Then, he and his new bride committed suicide. She took a cyanide tablet, and he shot himself in the temple. On May 2nd, Soviet soldiers hoisted the red hammer and sickle flag of the USSR over the German Reichstag, the symbolic heart of the German state, and the German forces remaining in Berlin surrendered. Just six days later, May 8th by Central European time, but May 9th by Moscow time, what remained of the German government surrendered unconditionally to the Allies. Soviet troops met with American and British troops in the center of Germany. They celebrated their shared victory together and posed for photo ops. There was a great deal of hope in the East and the West that these victorious Allies would be able to cooperate in peace as they had in war and bring about a better world. Relations between the Soviet Union and the Western Allies, however, had begun to turn sour even before the guns fell silent in Europe. The USSR's hot war with Nazi Germany was quickly transforming into a cold war with the Western democracies. That's everything for today. Thank you so much for listening. As always, thank you to the Blake Annex for the use of this recording space. If you haven't already, I encourage you to engage with us on social media for regular updates about the show and to visit our website at www.thehistorysphere.com. If you like what you heard and you want to support the show, you can support us on Spotify with a monthly donation. If you don't have a Spotify or you prefer to listen elsewhere, you can also support us on Patreon. The link to our Patreon can be found on the website. Next time on The History Sphere. I will explore the years of war and its immediate aftermath from a political rather than a military perspective and attempt to pinpoint the origins of the Cold War. Thank you so much for listening. Have a wonderful day. Mm-hmm.